All right, guys. So in this video, I'm going to be going through an example plane design and XFLR. We're going to go through how to form the analyses, export the arrow data, import it into MATLAB, and then build up your simulation and Simulink to be able to do your controls design for the pitch axis, basically. So we'll, we'll go through the longitudinal autopilot design, pitch angle reference, and then it's going to control the elevator to uh, stabilize about that reference point. So let's get started. All right, so the first thing, uh, we need some airfoils. So for this design, I'm just going to use, I'm going to use one of the Drela airfoils for the main wing, and then just use a couple symmetri uh, symmetric NACA airfoils for the elevator and rudder. So go to airfoil tools, and go to A, and then the AG03 flat bottom is what we're going to use. So we click that. Click the source dat file. I'm going to save this right here. So we'll call it ag03.dat. All right. And then I'm going to open up XFLR. And one thing I want to go through real quick in the options under preferences, I've gone ahead and changed some of the units. Uh, this is just kind of what I prefer for the design, but um, I just want to make you guys aware of it in case you're trying to like exactly match what I'm going through. Um, <clears throat> but you know, it can be whatever whatever you want, you just got to make sure that it's consistent across the design um, and the simulation aspect. So pretty much everything I do is going to be English. Okay, so let's go ahead and open up that airfoil. And then let's go to the direct foil design. So one thing that I saw in um, some of the videos on XFLR was they recommended resampling the airfoil geometry uh, once you've already imported it. So I think by default this one has yeah 180 points. So we're just going to go ahead and right click foil, refine globally, and we're going to change this to 100. So this is going to resample uh, at fewer points, and it should maintain the same sort of distribution where we have a higher density of points near the leading edge and then um, a fewer points as you kind of move away from the leading edge. So I'll go ahead and apply, hit OK. And well, we'll call it the AG03 flat bottom, that's fine. So we're going to overwrite this one. Now we also need to bring in our, our NACA airfoils. So to do that we can go to Foil, NACA Foils, and we're going to use a 0006, 100 panels, that'll be good. And then we're going to have three different versions. Um, since this is just going to be the pitch autopilot design, so a longitudinal plane, we're going to look at the elevator with the trailing edge neutral, with the trailing edge deflected up and deflected down. So this one is just going to be the uh, call it like natural NACA neutral. Yeah. There we go. Hit OK. And then let's go ahead. I think this should already be set to. Yeah, we'll just put it 100 for the refinement. There we go. And we'll overwrite that one. So now we want to create the airfoils that have the trailing edge up and down. So we can right click, foil, and we're going to set flap. We want to do a trailing edge flap, and we'll do 10 degrees down to begin with. We'll hit OK. We're going to call this one NACA down. And then we'll go back. Uh, don't I don't know if we need to refine it, but you know, might as well. It's already got 100. I think it did change the point distribution a little bit because you've moved the um, the rear portion of the airfoil, so it probably changes how it uh, distributes the the points throughout the airfoil geometry. All right, we'll just overwrite that one, and I'll go back to the neutral. Right click, foil, set flap, and this time we'll do negative 10. The one thing I'll point out real quick is positive. The um, orientation is positive is a trailing edge down, negative is a trailing edge up. So we just got to keep that in mind throughout the rest of the design. Uh, make sure we don't flip the signs or anything. So this one's going to be negative 10. Okay. This is going to be NACA up. We'll do that same geometry refinement. Okay. All right, so now we've got we've got our four airfoils. We have the main AG03 that's going to serve as our wing, and then we have the three NACA foils that we're going to use for our elevator and rudder. 
So what we want to do now is we want to go ahead and um, we want to run some analyses. So we're going to go to File, Exfoil, Direct Analysis. And then here, we want to go ahead and define an analysis. So we can go to Analysis, um, Multi-Threaded Batch Analysis. That sounds fancy. And let's see, we want to run this for all the airfoils. So we're going to go to Foil List, hit the Foil List button, select all of them. We're going to use the Reynolds Number List. The default list is pretty good, it should be fine. Uh, we're going to keep the transition location the same. I want to make sure that we have this box from zero checked. That's going to basically for the negative and positive ranges of angle attack, it's going to start at zero and then do the sweep. And I think that's it. Yeah, I didn't change anything here. So we'll go ahead. Um, I'm going to specify to use six out of eight cores just so it doesn't completely slow everything down because I'm doing the recording everything as well. And uh, we'll hit analyze, see what happens. So one other thing I'll mention while this is running, even though we just did, um, we just did the, the, the positive 10 degrees and the negative 10 degrees, um, from what I saw when I kind of went through this example previously, it's all, all the arrows pretty linear. So your control effectiveness, so your change in pitching moment as you change the elevator is very linear, at least um, in the XFLR predictions. So I'm just going to run a couple points, basically those three cases there, and then we'll just, you know, we'll be dangerous and we'll extrapolate the data to other um, other geometry. So, you know, most people are going to have more than 10 degree throw on the elevator. Um, so, you know, maybe we, we limit ourselves from the servo, we can go plus or minus 25. So we'll keep that um, we'll keep that limitation in the simulation, but for the aerodynamic data, we'll just extrapolate when we go beyond the plus or minus um, 10 degree deflection data that we'll have. All right, so this finished up. I'll go ahead and click close. We got a lot of a lot of lines here. So obviously, some of these didn't really converge, or if they did converge, they didn't give us good data. Especially like this case right here, where you can see we have a lift to drag over um, over 500. So obviously, there's a problem going on there. Um, one thing to keep in mind though is that you really only need to have good data. Well, I'll say like this, if you're, for your designs where you need to be a little bit more um, thorough, you probably want to check and make sure that you're getting pretty good error predictions for, um, for most of the cases. But for the case I'm doing, I really only care about my trim condition. So it's just going to be the, the trim flight path angle, the trim glide, uh, and the angle attack that's going to correspond to basically lift is equal to weight. So we're not going to use a lot of this data here. Um, so from what I saw, these kind of outlying cases didn't really impact the final results. But um, as you go through this process, you'll be able to look at your final plane data, so the total error for the plane. You'll be able to see, OK, there's something odd going on. If there is, you probably need to trace it back to maybe you had weird predictions for one of your airfoils at one of the Reynolds numbers that you ran. So um, just keep that in mind as, as we move forward. Okay, so we've got a bunch of data here. The next thing we want to do is we want to start defining our plane. So we're going to go to File, Wing and Plane Design. Hit this guy here, the little plane button. It's going to give us a 3D view. And we can right click. No, we can't do that. We can't right click. We have to go to Plane and define a new plane. So here we're going to specify uh, the configuration, the geometry for the plane. So we're going to go to the main wing, Define. And we want to use our AG03. So we'll select the AG03 for both of these. We're going to make it a, a two foot wing. So I'll change it to 24. We'll do a four inch cord with no sweep. So the offset will be set to zero. And let's throw in like 10 degrees of dihedral. So we'll go ahead and save that. And we'll do the elevator. We'll do, let's see, we want to use our, our NACA neutral for the initial design. We'll do six inches with a four inch cord, no offset, no dihedral. Save that. And let's put this, just to keep all the numbers nice and around, 24 inches behind uh, the leading edge of the wing. And now we'll define the tail. So we'll use that same NACA neutral airfoil. Why not? Six inches sounds good. And then four inch cord. So it's basically just the uh, just the elevator, but uh, rotated 90 degrees. So we'll save and close that. 
we'll also put this one at 24 and hit OK. And now we've got kind of an outline for our wing. We can hit this uh, services checkbox over here and then you'll get some colors for, for the design. So pretty basic, but I think it'll be, uh, it'll be good enough to illustrate what we're trying to do for this design. So, okay. Um, something else that we want to be able to set up here is we want to make sure that we have all the mass properties accurate because what's going to happen is when XFLR calculates all of the aerodynamic data, it's going to calculate that data at the CG. So depending on how you have the masses of, um, of all the different elements of your plane, that's going to affect the stability. It's going to affect the aerodynamic data that you generate. So we will go ahead and we'll define all those mass properties and check the surfaces guy. So we're going to right click current plane, edit, and then plane inertia. So we can specify some weights for each of these different components. We're going to go ahead and say that the main wing is 50 grams. We'll say the elevator and the tail are each 10 grams. And then we're going to add a couple more masses. We'll, we'll add one mass that's at the leading edge of the wing. And we'll say that's going to be what the motor is. So let's say we got 50 grams at zero for the motor. And then we'll say we've got another 50 grams, five inches ahead of the leading edge. And that's going to be like our avionics. So in this coordinate system, positive X is uh, moving backwards from the wing towards the elevator. So negative five is going to specify that we've got a 50 gram point mass five inches ahead of the leading edge of the wing. So once we do that, we click OK. We can also display the masses with this checkbox here. And you'll see we've got, we have the elevator and tail, each 10 grams. The wing is 50 grams. And then we have a mass here. This would be like your rocket engine, maybe 50 grams, your avionics. And then this, uh, the larger one here, this is your center of gravity. So the total plane is 170 grams and that that weight force is going to act through this point right here. Um, so you can see it's kind of in the middle of the airfoil, um, and we'll see how that impacts our, our stability shortly. Okay, so we're going to go ahead and we're going to run some analyses. So the first thing we want to do is define an analysis. We're going to run a fixed speed. We'll do like 30 feet per second. So this is assuming you've already gone through and you figured out what speed you need to be flying at to be able to trim your max LVD to maximize your glide range. So we'll just assume it's 30 feet per second here. Under analysis, I'm going to leave all the same inertia, use the plane inertia for the reference dimensions. Um, I'm going to change this from the wing plan form projected on the XY plane to just the wing plan form. And that's literally just so that I have nicer numbers to work with for the reference area and reference length. So I'll hit that guy and the rest of this we can keep the same. So now we have the ability to run an alpha sequence. So I'm going to hit the sequence button. We're going to go from alpha 0 to alpha 10 in one degree increments. Hit analyze. And you'll see it encountered some errors. So if you look here for alpha 10 and alpha 9, it was unable to interpolate a CL value of, you know, a little over 1 for this particular Reynolds number. So likely what happened was when we solved for the individual airfoils for that Reynolds number, the airfoil did not achieve that particular CL. So that's not a huge deal for us for the controls design because we're going to be trimming at a lot lower angle of attack, you know, probably one to three, somewhere in there, maybe two to four. And um, the controls design is going to be at our sort of steady state operating point, which is going to be that alpha region. So as long as we have aero data above and below that, we'll be fine from a control standpoint. And what we'll do is we'll just go ahead and limit our data to eight degrees when we kind of build the Excel table, and then we're just going to extrapolate outside of that. Let's go ahead and close this. And we can go, we can click this graph here, and we can see the polar view. So right now I have this configured to display CL, CD, uh, lift over drag, and CM. If you want to change that, you can right click, uh, current graph, define graph settings, and you can adjust what you want to plot versus what. Um, so a couple things to note here, uh, lift over drag ratio is pretty darn good. You know, these are still probably dream numbers. Uh, you can see you, if you went from the, the airfoil it would be really high, like maybe 50 or 60. And then when you do the plane design, it's going to drop down a lot. And then if you ran CFD here, you'd probably, um, cause you'd have the body in there, you'd probably see even, even worse numbers. So it, it only gets worse, <laughs> but, um, you know, that's not super important for the controls design, very important for your fly out models and, you know, sort of the system performance, but. For the controls, really what we care about is, um, for the longitudinal autopilot, what, what does CM look like? 
So you'll see here we have a negative CM alpha, which is good. It means the plane's going to be statically stable. And uh, just to kind of illustrate this, I'm going to go back and let's say we got rid of this uh, avionics guy right here. So the center of gravity is going to move backwards. And in fact, right now with the configuration we have, the center of gravity is right here, two, right around two inches uh, rear of the leading edge of the wing. And the neutral point is 3.8 or 3.8 inches rear. So we have the neutral point behind the CG, so that's good, we're statically stable, but I bet if we get rid of this mass here, that's going to shift the CG behind the neutral point. So let's try that, let's see what it does. So I did um, right click current plane, edit, plane inertia, let's get rid of this mass here, the 50 that's 5 inches ahead of the leading edge. We'll delete that, hit OK. It's going to say, hey, you made some modifications, I'm going to delete all your data, that's fine. And we will... Run it again, and if we go to our plots and say, boom, we've got a positive CM alpha now. So we are now statically unstable, and if we go back to the 3D view, we can see that, hey, our CG is uh, 4.95 inches back, and our neutral point is 3.8. So um, bad news bears there. We're going to go ahead and add back in that avionics mass. So this was 50 at negative 5. Hit OK. Okay, okay, we'll run it again. Just check our, our curves here to make sure they look good. Yep, that looks good. So now what we want to do is we want to do the same analysis, but we want to look at the elevator um, with trailing edge down deflection and trailing edge up deflection. So what we can do is we can duplicate this plane. I'm going to right click, current plane, duplicate. And I'm going to call this one positive. So this is going to be positive deflection. You know what? I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to rename this one. It's called plane name right now. So I'm going to go to current plane, rename, and let's call it neutral. And then we'll go back to our positive. So here we need to edit the elevator airfoil to be our NACA airfoil that had the trailing edge down, the positive deflection. So I'm going to go to current plane, edit. The elevator, we're going to switch this to the NACA, um, NACA down. We're doing down, right? No. Yeah, down. It's positive deflection is trailing edge down. All right, we'll do the same thing here. And you can see how we have the trailing edge down now. Let's save, okay. And we will, we need to define an analysis this, since this is uh, grayed out. Go to analysis, define an analysis. It'll keep all your previous settings. We'll just hit okay and analyze. And you'll see we're gonna have issues for that same nine and 10 degree angle of attack, but you know, not a big deal. And then we're going to do the same thing. We're going to go ahead and duplicate this plane again. And we'll call this negative. The negative is going to be with the trailing edge up. So we'll go to current plane, edit, elevator, change this to NACA up. All right, save. OK. Analysis, define an analysis, same thing, and run. Uh, so we're good to 8 degrees alpha just like before and we've got our data here. So you can, the cool thing is you can kind of see the pressure uh, coefficient distributions change as we go from uh, you know the positive to the neutral to the negative and then also as we go to different angles of attack you can see how that changes as well. So if we go to the, the higher angles of attack you can see we have a low pressure on the top of the wing and then a, a pretty high pressure on the bottom side of the wing. All right, and let's look at the data. Let's see what it looks like. So if we go to the polar view, see we've got three curves now. These three curves represent our different elevator positions. So if you look here, our neutral configuration is this blue color. So if we move the elevator trailing edge down, which would be positive deflection or the purple line, we're gonna see we do increase our lift, which makes sense. And we decrease our pitching moment. We, we can look for the negative deflection here That'll increase our pitching moment and decrease our lift. So out of all of these, the neutral, so no deflection, is going to have the highest L over D, which we see here. And I think all the data looks pretty good. It seems to make sense. So now what we want to do is we want to export all of this. So we can go to Polars, Export All Polars. And I'm just going to select this folder here. And then once that's done, you'll see we'll get a few spreadsheets we can look at. 
yep, there we go. So we have negative, neutral, and positive. So I'm going to make a new spreadsheet that is just uh, my combined arrow data. And I know we're going to have values for different angles of attack, different elevator deflections, and then we're going to look at CL, CD, CM. So let's go ahead. We'll pull up. Um, we want to do the negative deflections first, and then zero, and then positive. So we'll pull up the negative. So for all of these, our alpha range is going to be 0 to 8. So I'm just going to go ahead and copy that over. And this, the negative here was the negative 10 degrees, if you remember from how we defined the airflow earlier. So this is all going to be negative 10. And then now we just need to copy our arrow data. So we want CL, CD, and CM. All right. And now we're going to do the same thing, but for zero degrees deflection. We'll close this, we'll go to neutral. We'll copy again the same one, CL, CD, and CM. And finally, we're going to get the positive deflection. Close this, open up the positive deflection data. CL, CD, CM. All right, so we'll go ahead and save this. And we can do a couple sanity checks just to make sure there's nothing we screwed up. So if you look at the case for a zero angle of attack with a negative 10 degree elevator deflection, that's going to be the trailing edge up. So you see we have a positive CM. If you look at the zero degree deflection, it's still positive, but it's basically zero. And then at the positive deflection, which would be trailing edge down, this will be of a negative CM. So I think all that makes sense. We'll go ahead and save this. And then we're going to open up MATLAB and pull in the data. All right, so I'm going to go to where I have that data. And I'm just going to double click on that arrow data spreadsheet. That'll open up the import wizard. And you'll see right now it's going to import it as a bunch of different column vectors, which is fine. For some reason it wants to call this alpha 1. Don't quite get that. We're going to change it to just alpha. So we'll have alpha, elevator, CL, CD, and CM. All right. So the first thing we want to do is we want to get what are the unique alpha and elevator breakpoints. So we can do that just by using the unique command. So we're going to say alpha is the unique alpha. And you'll see we've got 0 through 8, and then elevator equals unique elevator. And we have negative 10, 0, and 10. So now we need to reshape our CL, CD, and CM matrices such that they are um, basically the number of alpha entries uh, long by the number of def or, uh, deflection entries wide. So we would have, let's see, how many how many alphas do we have? Just nine entries, right? Yeah, so it'd be a nine by three, nine rows by three columns. So we can say CL equals reshape CL length alpha by length elevator. All right, and we'll do the same thing with CD and CM. Okay. So we're also going to need to know some other information as well. We need to know our reference area and our cord length. So if you go back to XFLR, we can look over here um, and the like the, the polar view, we can see, okay, our reference area is 192 square inches. So we're going to say S equals 192 divided by 144. Um, that's just to get us from square inches to square feet. And C was 4 inches. Let's also, let's look at our mass. So our total mass is 170 grams, but we need that in slugs. So we can, you know, we'll ask Google that one. You can see I've done this before. <laughs> so we'll take that. This is going to be our mass. What else do we need to know? We need to know our wax, this moment of inertia. So IYY is going to be equal to 
And we can get that by going back to our 3D view, right click, current plane, edit, plane inertia. And our Y axis principal moment of inertia is 0.21818 uh, pound feet squared. So we need to convert that to slug feet squared. And we can do that just by dividing by gravity. Speaking of gravity, before we do that, let's go ahead and put in a uh, gravity constant here. So we'll call that uh, 32.174. And then our IYY is going to be equal to point, uh, what was it? 21818. 0.21818 divided by gravity. There we go. So I think that should cover all of our sort of physical constants that we're going to need for the model. So I'm going to save all these in a um, like an arrow data dot maps, and it's going to be alpha elevator CLCD CM S C M G and I Y Y. Lots of things. But now clear the workspace, reload this, we should have everything we need. So from this, we're going to go ahead and start building our model. So I'm going to right click, create a new model. And let's call it a longitudinal plant. So we'll open up that guy. And we're greeted with a terrifying blank canvas from which we have to craft a beautiful model. So we know we're going to need to do some interpolation. So I'm going to go ahead and put in an interpolation using pre-lookup block. And let's see, what is this one going to be called? This one's going to be CL lookup. It's a little bit bigger. And if we double click that, the data is just going to be CL where it's gonna be uh, two, two input dimensions, angle of attack and elevator, and we're gonna do linear extrapolation. So that looks good. And let's go ahead, we need a pre-lookup block to go with that. So we've got this one, this is gonna be alpha pre-lookup. Go in here and set this to be alpha, angle of attack. Again, linear extrapolation. And then we're gonna need a elevator pre-lookup. I'll go in here and specify elevator. So let's go ahead and connect these. So the way I just did that was uh, if you select a block, hold control, and then click another block, it's going to route the outputs to however many inputs correspond to the number of outputs of the block that you clicked first. So that's a nice little trick to get the routing going pretty quickly. And we're going to need an input for alpha and an input for elevator. You can duplicate box by uh, control clicking and dragging. So if I wanted to duplicate this block, which I do, I'm just going to hold control, click and drag. And we're going to call this one CD lookup. Let's see. I want to capitalize these. I guess I should capitalize these. Why not? We'll leave all the outputs lowercase. Then we need to change this to CD. All right. And then we'll have one more for CM. Change the value to CM. All right, now we get to connect all the lines. Okay. And so this is going to give us CLCD CM as a function of alpha and elevator. We know that when we dimensionalize this, they're all going to be multiplied by our dynamic pressure, by our wing reference area, and then additionally, CM is going to be multiplied by the chord length. So we can go ahead and put that in here. So I'm going to put in a gain block, and the constant's going to be C. And then I'm just going to go ahead and mux all of these together. 
gives the rest of the equations the same. It's going to be multiplied then by s. And then finally multiplied by q, dynamic pressure, but that has to be calculated. So I'm going to use a product block to do that. There is a block up here to calculate dynamic pressure. We'll use that. We'll feed dynamic pressure here to the product there. And it needs to know density and velocity. So for density, we're going to add an atmosphere model. Type in at, let's see, ATM. Then you're going to get this guy, the COESA atmosphere model. We'll make this a little bit bigger. And we're going to connect density to density, and we can just terminate the rest of these. We're not going to be using them. And we need to double click this. We need a one work in uh, English velocity feet per second. And then if we're out of range, it'll just do its extrapolation. It doesn't need to warn us. That's fine. And we're going to use the uh, 1976 standard day atmosphere. Okay. And the input to this guy is going to be altitude. Altitude. All right. I'm going to add a little bit more space here. And then we also need to pass in velocity. So I'll make an input here. And it's going to be called V. Now the issue is I want to pass in total velocity but dynamic pressure this block expects the velocity vector so a three element vector so to kind of fake it out i'm just going to create a dummy gain here and the gain value is going to be one zero zero so that's just going to take our scalar turn it into the vector and that'll make the block happy all right and there we go so that is our i think that's everything for at least the arrow and it's really more than just the arrow it's the arrow plus the atmosphere plus the force build up oh nope missed something okay so right now this is going to be it's going to output a muxed version of our uh, forces and moments so we need to demux these because i want to have them as separate outputs so i'm going to add a demux three outputs and let's see out one so this is going to be lift drag and our pitching moment. Okay, so that's looking pretty good. Uh, so the next thing I'm going to do, I'm going to take all of this and turn it into a subsystem. So I can just press Control A, Control G. That made it a subsystem. I'm going to get, get rid of all of these now. Make it a little bit bigger. And we're going to call this just uh, arrow. We've got our aerodynamics. It's going to give us lift drag and our pitching moment is a function of alpha elevator, altitude, and velocity. So now we need our equations of motion. So if I go ahead and type in 3 off, there is a wind axis 3 off, and this is going to be two translational, one rotational degree of freedom. You can kind of move in the uh, in the pitch plane, if you will, downrange and at altitude. Um, and then it's also going to have the rotational dynamics. So you the input in the system is going to be that pitching moment. All right. I'm just going to line these up and connect them. So one thing you'll notice is that the inputs here are fx, fz, and m. The m is probably okay, but the, the lift and drag are going to be not exactly what we're looking for for fx and fz. So I'm going to go ahead and disconnect these. Uh, so lift and drag, lift is going to be positive up and drag is positive aft. But for fx and fz, fx is positive forward and fc is positive down. So they're both, both of these are still in the wind axis, so they're aligned with the velocity vector, but we need to change some of the signs. So we need to add a negative one here for lift and a negative one for drag. And since lift is really going to be the kind of like the, um, the second output, it would be equivalent to our fz, I'm going to go ahead and change this such that it's the second output, just by double clicking on the output port and changing the port number to two. And then we're gonna call this 
Um, so this would really be like Z, and this would be X. So it was drag, but if we change the sign, we're going to call it the X force, and then lift with the sign negated is going to be our Z force. And now that should that should line up pretty closely with this. Uh, we also need a let's make this one a little bit bigger as well. Just give ourselves a little bit more room to work with here. The other thing we want to do is we need to configure this 3 dot block. So if you double click on it, uh, let's change it to English. Our initial airspeed, I'm going to make a lot of these parameters defined in the workspace. So I'm going to say initial airspeed is going to be V0. Initial flight path angle is going to be gamma 0. Initial incidence will be alpha 0. We'll start with 0 rotation rate, so 0 Q. And then let's start 100 feet in the air maybe. Um, so XZ. Uh, is the um, kind of the reference directions X is positive like downrange and then Z is positive down so if we want to start 100 feet in the air we have to make it negative 100 our initial mass is going to be M our inertia in the body axes is IYY and gravity is G so we need to go ahead and define these these three in the base workspace something else too I like to keep everything in the base workspace or when I'm plotting in degrees but the 3 dot model requires all these to be radians. So I'm going to go ahead and do a degdarad on this guy and degdarad on this guy. Okay. So you can see these change from newtons to pound force, pound force feet. And the other thing I want to do is I'm going to adjust the order of our inputs here because alpha is down here. So I want that to be the last one. And then we'll do elevator above it. And then up here, we'll do velocity and altitude because that'll just make the lines a little bit cleaner. So let's see. The first one is going to be velocity. So we'll change that to one. And then altitude. And then angle of attack. Actually, no, we want to make angle of attack the last one. So velocity, altitude, elevator, angle of attack. So now this will connect nicely. So we can go ahead and connect angle of attack to angle of attack. Uh, we need to note though that this is going to be output in radians. We are expecting this in degrees in the arrow model. So we'll do a radians to degrees and we can flip the block direction by doing control I. Alright, our elevator, we're going to make that an input to the system. Okay, and then now we need to grab Let's grab the velocity first. We have the velocity as an output, VW, so that's going to be velocity in the wind axis. But really what we want is, um, we just want the magnitude of velocity, so the total velocity here. So what we can do is just do a little dot product. It's a nice little trick. I'm going to invert it. And we'll hook this up to the velocity. Then if you dot a vector with itself, you get the sum of the squares, and then we can just do a square root, and now we've got the magnitude. And we'll feed that magnitude into V right there. Now we need the altitude. Altitude's going to come from the position. But again, we only care about the second entry, and Z is positive down, so we need to flip this. So we're going to need to do a selector. Let's see, this is going to be a two element vector because it's X and Z, and then we're going to select the second element. Control I to flip it. Alright, we'll hook it up to XZ. And we will do a negative one on it to get it to be the right sign. Okay, we'll hook that up to altitude. Alright, so far so good. Let's see what else do we want to look at here. So we're probably we're going to want to output uh, our pitch rate for the controller. We're going to do an out. We're going to call this Q for our pitch rate. We'll hook it up to this. But again, this is radians per second. We're going to want this in degrees per second. So we'll do a radians to degrees, just like that.
And then finally, let's see, we could probably terminate some of these signals. We don't care about the accelerations. So we're gonna terminate those. And we don't really care about the angular accelerations there. We have both those terminated. One thing we do care about though, is we care about our pitch angle because that's what we're gonna use for feedback. And you'll notice the pitch angle is an output here, but they do output angle of attack and fly path angle. So we can just sum those two together. And uh, let's see, that'll be plus plus height. And then that's gonna be our pitch angle. Again, we need to convert it to degrees. And we can output it. So we'll call this theta. The other thing we want to do is we probably want to label some of these signals that way when we and use them in the data inspector, they'll have nicer names. So I'm going to call this one elevator. This is going to be alpha. This will be velocity, altitude, um, Q. And I'm just double clicking on the line to rename it and theta. We also want to log these, so I'll go ahead and select them all using the shift key. And go here. Newer versions of Simulink don't have the separate stream uh, to data inspector and log options. It's just one general log option, but I'm a peasant and I have a like a MATLAB 2015 copy. So I've got both the options. I'm gonna use the stream selected signals to the data inspector. Okay, so I think we're about ready to build the model. Uh, hopefully we didn't make any errors. So I'm gonna press Control D to build it and we'll see what happens. And of course we have errors. So what's it complaining about? Oh, well we didn't define any of these in the base workspace. We gotta do that. So V0, we're gonna say V0, it's gonna be 30 feet per second, alpha zero. Let's just try like around two degrees, angle of attack, and gamma zero, we'll just start it, zero degrees. Okay, so now we can go, we can rebuild the model and no errors, all right, so that's awesome. So we can run a time domain simulation and see what happens. So we can go ahead and hit the play button or control T will run it. And then we're gonna hit this guy right here, the data inspector, and we can look at some of the plots. So right now I've got this set up as a three by two array. You can adjust that by going to the format tab and then subplots, I can make it just a one by one or I can do a three by two like I had. And then let's look at, so let's look at the short period states over here. So we'll plot angle of attack and pitch rate. And then over here, we'll look at our fugoid states. So we'll have velocity and um, pitch angle. Then maybe down here, let's look at our, our elevator position. And then over here, our altitude. Okay. So the first thing you'll notice is that there's an like an initial transient and angle of attack and pitch rate. And this is this is gonna be the short period states damping out. And then we have a, a longer period oscillation here. And this is gonna be our fugoid mode. So you can kind of see the uh, the difference in, in frequency and, and in period. And we'll be able to see that more clearly when we look at a pole zero map of the, the open loop system. So I think we've got everything working working properly here. So I think the next step is gonna to be to do some linearization, some trimming, and see what exactly, uh, you know, what, what we're dealing with exactly. So I'm gonna go ahead and minimize this for now. And we're gonna to go to the analysis, control design, linear analysis. All right, so the first thing we wanna do is we wanna trim the model. So we wanna get this model in a steady state condition where we can perform some sort of linear analysis. So under operating point, I'm gonna click that and then we're gonna trim the model right here. And this gives us a nice GUI that we can use to figure out what states are known, what's unknown, what's steady state, and what's not steady state. So let's just go down the list, alpha. So we know alpha's in steady state. It's not gonna be changing during the glide period. Uh, but we don't know exactly what that angle of attack value is. So I'm gonna leave the known box unchecked and leave the steady state box checked. For velocity, we know it's gonna be 30. So I'm gonna check that and it's not gonna be changing. Fly path angle won't be changing, but we don't know exactly what it is. Our position, since we're in a glide, both of those are gonna be changing. So 
I'm going to uncheck the steady state box and then Q is going to be uh, remain constant and we know it's zero. Under inputs, we don't know what the elevator deflection is. This is going to tell us. And then for outputs, um, these are both already states, so we're just not going to adjust them here since they already have constraints from being states. So we can go ahead, we can click start trimming. And it's going to go ahead. It says it started off with uh, with a 47 sort of norm error, and then all the way after a couple of iterations, got all the way down to times 10 to the negative 12th. So that looks pretty good. If we click on this op trim one, we can see, okay, what, what are the different values? So it ended up trimming out at an alpha value here, pipe path angle here, and then our elevator deflection is around negative 0.54. So we'll close this. Now one thing we're going to want to do is we're going to want to bring um, this operating point we just created. We want to bring it into the MATLAB workspace. So we can click in the linear analysis workspace, drag it into the MATLAB workspace, and we're going to use that to be able to set our, our alpha zero, gamma zero, and some of those other guys. But before we do that, we've got our operating point. Let's look at um, let's look at a couple uh, linear analysis plots. So the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to generate a pole zero map. So I uh, just hit the little arrow here, hit pole zero. And let's see what's there. There are no linearization. Oh, we didn't tell what we wanted to linearize. So right now it's set to model IOs, but we didn't define anything. So we're just going to say, hey, linearize at the root level inputs and outputs. So if you look at our model, that's going to be our inputs going to be the elevator, and our outputs are going to be pitch rate and pitch attitude. So we've done that. We'll go ahead and we'll try it again. Pull zero map. I think it liked it this time. Okay, and I'm going to go ahead and right click and display the grid. So I've got a lot of stuff going on here. You'll notice there's two poles right here. So these are going to be faster. These are our short period poles. And then if we zoom in, I'm going to go to the pole zero map, get the cursor. If we zoom in around here, we'll see three more poles. So we have one pole with the origin. That's for the pitch attitude. That's just the, the integrator that takes us from pitch rate to pitch angle. And then we have two more. Uh, poles here, these are going to be our, our fugoid states. So we've got the fugoid mode here, and then the short period mode was the, the faster one we saw before. Okay, so I took a break real quick just to take a look at some of my data because I got thrown off here when I saw the uh, that we had a stable fugoid because when I went through this example before, uh, get ready for this, I, I saw that it was an unstable fugoid and I spent a little bit of time looking into that. So I think I found what the problem is. Um, if we go back in the workspace, when we defined S, we, we made sure to convert from square inches to square feet, but we never did that for C. So right now C is saying it's a four foot cord. So if we take that, let's make C four divided by 12. Okay, now we're at the 0.333. Uh, we, we're gonna need to go back and uh, retrim the model. Let's see, so I'm just gonna restart the session here. Close that. We'll go go here, analysis, control design, linear analysis. We'll do the same thing where the operating point we're going to, let's get rid of, uh, okay, well, let's get rid of that existing op trim one. So if I go back to the MATLAB workspace, we'll just clear op trim one. All right, and then back in this guy, we're going to go ahead and trim the model again. We're going to use the same settings used before, so steady state alpha, steady state unknown v, steady state gamma, non-steady position, steady state unknown q. Start the trimming. It's trimmed. We've got op trim one with the same settings as before. Likely, let's see. I think it's. It might actually be exactly the same. It might be a little bit different elevator deflection. I don't, I don't recall. Um, but we'll go ahead and close this. We'll move this back over to the MATLAB workspace, and uh, we'll we'll continue on with the with linear analysis. So you'll see how how this is going to change the uh, change the results. So if we go to analysis IOs, we learned our lesson from before that has to be the root level inputs and outputs. And let's go ahead and do our pole zero map again. Okay. So we'll do the grid. Let's see, yeah, so that, that's a little more like it. 13 ratings per second for the short period. And if we zoom in, we still have our, our um, short period mode here, those two poles. And then here we'll see a barely, barely unstable fugoid. And then we still have our integrator at the origin for the, the pitch attitude state. So 
that looks more like what I'm, what I'm used to seeing. Um, maybe not in real life, but uh, at least for this example project, uh, that's what I saw before. So we'll, we'll keep on going then. So the other one we are going to want to look at is uh, we can look at a Bodhi plot. So we're going to keep the same configuration, but just generate a Bodhi plot. And let's go ahead and just look at the first one. So it's Q and theta. We only want to look at Q. So you can right click IO selector, click this, that'll hide it. And then let's also, let's, let's adjust the frequency range here. Um, so sorry, I keep doing things without saying it. Uh, right click and then properties, limits. Let's go from 0.01 to 1000. Display the grid. So you'll see we have really sharp resonance right here, right around where our fugoid is. If we uh, take the cursor, let's see, how do we do that? Oh, yeah, just click on it. So that's right at 1.5 ratings per second. If you look back here, this guy there is that same 1.5 ratings per second. And you'll see it's, you know, basically, um, it's right on the edge of the imaginary axis, so it's pretty much not damped at all. Uh, really, by, by definition, it's it's not damped because it's, it's unstable here. It's, it's in the right half plane. Um, but you, you'll see this, you know, really sharp spike right there for the uh, fugoid mode. Now on a lot of a lot of problems, a lot of airframes, you're gonna see another, not as uh, dramatic, but a little bit um, of a less pronounced spike at the higher frequencies, and that's gonna be our short period. But our short period, if we go back to the pull zero map, the short period is, is pretty well damped. It's a 0.85 damping ratio. Uh, so that's why you're not really gonna see much of a resonance in the Bode plot there. So, so we looked at this uh, in the frequency domain now let's go ahead, let's run a quick simulation and kind of see what happens. So I'm going to close this. And I'm not going to initialize my model in steady state yet because I want to see um, what happens when we when we look at a, like a step change in the elevator. We, we uh, excite it in a couple other ways. So I'm going to pull this back up, my data inspector. Now these, these results are going to change a little bit when I rerun this because I haven't rerun it with the, the new C bar yet. Let's see. Yeah, it looks, looks pretty similar. There we go. Okay, so, well, actually looks pretty darn similar. So, one thing that we want to test is I'm going to replace this input here with a step. And we're going to step the system. We'll do like a two, negative two degree deflection at five seconds. And uh, since I deleted the block that was sourcing the log signal, I have to go click this and then uh, restream it again. All right, so we'll run that and take a look. Oh no. Okay, all right, so I, so I found another problem here. So you'll notice that it didn't change at all. <laughs> the reason it didn't change is because each one of these new runs that we've done um, is stored as a separate data set. So if we want to keep updating the overlays here, we have to right click here and say overwrite run. So now we'll run this again. Yeah, it's totally different now. And um, likely if we if we put this actually, let's, let's do that so you can see it. So let's move this back to the input, uh, just the regular elevator input. And we'll log that again. And we'll run it, control T. You'll see it looks different than the curve we had before. So. Before you had some um, some oscillation on that initial transient, uh, but now because of previously when we had the wrong uh, chord length in there, we had um, basically less damping in, in the short period. But now we have more damping in the short period, so that's why you don't really see any of this um, oscillation in the initial sort of alpha transient. There's, there's a whole lot of oscillation here, but that, that's the fugoid state that you're seeing, fugoid mode. Okay, so let's go back. Let's do our, our step again. Take a look and see what happens. All right, so at five seconds, if we get the elevator, we moved it from zero to negative two. So that's gonna be a trailing edge up deflection, which should give us a positive pitching moment, which would give us a positive pitch rate. So at five seconds, we see Q, our pitch rate goes positive, which is gonna increase our pitch angle, which would start to pull us up. So you can see we're, we're doing our fugoid all the way down, and then at five seconds, we start to pull up. And um, and once we pull up, we're gonna, we're gonna lose some velocity as well. 
That looks good. Let's change the direction just to, I don't know, just for funsies. And so we'll change this to a positive two degree deflection. That's going to be trailing edge down, which should give us a nose down moment, decrease our pitch rate, decrease our pitch angle, and increase our velocity. So if you look at that, five seconds, elevator goes positive, pitch rate goes negative, pitch angle goes negative. This causes us to um, kind of plummet towards the ground, if you will, and pick up velocity. Uh, and our angle of attack goes negative as well. So all, all this makes sense. Um, one thing to notice, you, you might remember we didn't run any negative alpha cases. Uh, but what it's going to do is it's going to go and just um, basically extrapolate that data, which I think for the era that we're working with, it's it's pretty pretty reasonable. One thing we can do real quick um, that we probably should have done before is we can plot up what our arrow looks like and, and just make sure when we looked at the data or when we brought the data into Mal, it all still made sense. So I'm going to go ahead and just plot alpha and CL. So you see very linear, um, you know, probably pretty safe, at least for the small angles of attack to do some extrapolation. We'll do the same thing for CD. Now CD is the only one, you know, if we go much higher than eight degrees, it would probably be better to have some sort of either quadratic or spline extrapolation, because if we just extrapolate this as linear, we're not going to really capture that quadratic effect that, that you would see in drag. And then we'll also plot CM, which is also pretty linear too. And all these curves match pretty well the curves you were seeing in XFLR, which makes sense because it's the same underlying data. Okay. So I think we're looking good here. So the next thing we want to do is we want to do the controller design. So one thing I'd like to do before we go to the controller design is I want to show uh, if we if we set our initial conditions for the model to uh, be those trim values that we're basically going to kind of maintain that 30 foot per second glide. So I'm going to go ahead and change this to a constant. And we call this elevator zero. And log it again. So what we're going to do is in the base workspace, we're going to look at that op trim one. So if we type that in and press enter, we're going to see all of the state values. So we can set alpha zero. It's going to be this. Now remember the underlying state is radian. So we're going to convert it to degrees. This is going to be rad to deg. There we go. Uh, gamma zero. Do the same thing for the gamma state. And elevator zero is going to be this right here. All right. So now that we've defined our initial conditions, we should be should be able to actually run the model. Let's see if we can save it, run it with Control T, and uh, let's see what happens. So, all right. So pretty much kept alpha right at this point here. Zero pitch rate. Our velocity is constant at around 30, and our altitude is steadily decreasing. So we've got a nice glide going on there. Um, so I think I think that that's looking good. So let's go on to the control section. So I'm going to replace this again with, uh, with just an input port. Call it elevator. Log the signal again. And then just like what we did with the error model, I'm going to press Control A, Control G, and then delete these guys just to uh, make this my total sort of like a nonlinear plant. And I think it actually gets it um, removed the logging on the elevator. So I'm going to go back in here, name the signal again, and log it. There we go. All right. So you know, one of the first things we could try. Let's see. We we need a reference signal, so we'll just we'll start with a constant for now. Just make it zero, and we'll put in a sum block to generate an error. We're gonna feed back. I'll tell you what, let's let's change the order of the alphas here. Make theta the top one. So I'm gonna double click on the Q port, make this two, and then for right now we're just gonna terminate Q. We're gonna feed back theta, and then we're gonna create a PID controller, hook it up, and then let's see what we can do here. So if you double click the PID controller. Right now it's going to be uh, PID. Let's try just with the proportional control first. So we'll hit apply, hit tune, 
and let's see what we can do. So this is, we just, we're gonna have one controller, it's gonna operate on the pitch angle error and it's gonna generate an elevator signal. So, let's see what it looks like. So this knob up here allows us to adjust the response time. And uh, that doesn't look very good. Let's see. So we want this to basically, this is gonna be our step response that we're looking at. So you can see the problem is if we make it slower such that there's less oscillation, we just kind of get this gradual drift over time. Whereas if we speed it up, so we increase the gain, we bring the steady state error down, but now we're introducing all these oscillations. So I don't think proportional control is gonna work. So let's close that. Let's switch it to PI controller. So we'll have proportional plus integral action. Hit apply and hit tune. Let's see what this looks like. Okay. So we can we kind of have a similar problem here. So if we if we make the response time slow to reduce the oscillation, we're going to get that same sort of gradual drift off until maybe we do something super slow here, but then it's going to take us 10 seconds to get to our set point and we're going to have like 60% overshoot. So I don't think this is going to work either. Now, you know, if you increase the gain high enough, you get a whole bunch of oscillations here and the response time is really quick. So the other problem is that's going to be telling you to move your actuator, move your servo really fast too. And you might not be able to move it that fast. So right now we're not really modeling a, um, an actuator, but in real life, you're going to have a limit on how fast you can move that fin, which is going to be based off of the dynamics of your servos that you're using and the control linkages. So the other thing we can do is we can try to play around with this transient behavior. What this does is it, it affects the kind of the target phase margin that it's shooting for. So if we move this to aggressive, you'll see it's going to increase our overshoot, but increase um, potentially increase our, our um, basically our our time to get within a, a certain sort of error bound. <clears throat> and if we move it this way, there's a point where it really just doesn't do anything more. It kind of depends on. Um, what the system is you're controlling and what the configuration is. So, so that's that's not really going to work. So let's let's try the, let's try the PID. See if we can do anything better with that. Hit apply tune. <clears throat> okay, so now now we're starting to get somewhere. So on first glance, the transient response looks pretty good. But you know this is this is pretty fast rise time. So this is saying that you know we're basically into 100% of our command in less than, you know, 0.2 seconds. So my concern here is that it's going to be a lot for the actuator. And what we can do is we can go ahead and add a plot and it's going to be a step of the controller effort. I'll maximize this. And this, what you're looking at here, this is what the elevator is going to try to do. So this is going to show you the elevator deflection in degrees for a unit change in your step command. So in this case, this would be a one degree pitch attitude set point change and then this is saying, hey, we're going to try to move the elevator, you know, 54-ish degrees up. So you don't, you probably don't even have that much travel. So you know, if we want to reduce the control effort, we can we can try to slow down the response here. So you can see that we we're continuing to reduce this. We probably want it even even less. Another thing is we have an instantaneous sort of jump in our rate. We're never really going to be able to achieve that. So. I mean, we can try it just to see what's going to happen with the understanding that, hey, it's not really going to be realistic because we're not going to be able to just kind of instantaneously yank the elevator to that new position. But you know what? Let's, let's, let's see what happens. So I'm going to update that. I hit OK. And I'm going to name this signal ref for our reference. And, uh, you know, let's, let's run it and see what happens. So we ran it. I'm going to press space to resize everything. And uh, for theta, I'm also going to plot our, our reference point here. So you'll see it's just a dot right now. That's because we need to change this. If we double click, change it from an infinite sample time to a zero sample time, and then it'll log the data. So we ran it again. So, you know, we, we kind of get there, we're headed there eventually, but it's taken a long time. And if we look at our elevator, let me uh, remove the reference signal here. Let's zoom in on our elevator. This one, you know, it it's assuming we can instantaneously move it there, which you know it's fine because we have, we don't have an actuator model, but we just have to realize that with the real system, that's that's going to cause a problem. So, so 
So we, we need to find a better way to do this. So one approach that's often taken is to kind of break up the controls design process into loops that have um, basically faster or slower and slower dynamics as you move outward. So your inner loop would be, would be the fastest loop. It would take care of stabilizing the fast plant dynamics. So in this case, you know, maybe the, uh, it would be part of the short period, but it would be sort of our, our pitch rate. And then we would have a slower loop on the outside that would take care of um, the reference quantity that we want to track. So in this case, our pitch attitude. So we'd have an outer pitch angle controller, which would drive an inner pitch rate controller. So let's give that a shot. So in this case, I'm going to delete this line here, and I'm going to feedback Q. And let's change this. Let's go back to our proportional controller and see, see how that works. I'm going to hit apply, and we're going to tune. Okay, so we got problems. <laughs> uh, oh boy! So let's try to uh, let's try to speed it up. And all we're doing is just really, yeah. So that that's not going to work. And even if the response did look decent, another problem we're going to have is since it's just proportional control. Let's say we have zero error here. That's going to result in a zero elevator deflection. But as you saw from the previous plots, if we go back to XFLR, if we want to be at you know let's say we want to be at six degrees angle of attack, you can't have a zero elevator deflection because then you're going to have a negative pitching moment. So you would have to have some elevator deflection to be able to hold whatever angle of attack you're trying to trim at. So we need this to be at least proportional and integral action. So change it to a PI, apply, we'll tune it, and let's see what we can do. Okay, this is looking a little bit better. So Let's go ahead and let's add that controller effort plot again. No, nope, that's not what I want. Not the body plot, the time domain plot. Step controller effort. Okay, now this is looking a little more reasonable. You know, we don't have that, that initial spike up to 50 like we did previously. Um, so I think this is good. So we might wanna, we might wanna slow it down a little bit. Um, Let's see, if we slow it down, we can we can kind of reduce some of the initial overshoot, but you know, it's really not that bad. Um, so there's one other plot we probably want to look at is we're gonna we're gonna add a plot, Bodhi, open loop Bodhi plot. And let's go ahead and rearrange this stuff. So I'm gonna take the controller effort, drag it down here, and in the Bodhi plot, we're gonna adjust the scale to our frequency range of interest 0 0.01 to a thousand, hit OK. And we want to right click characteristics, minimum stability margins. So what, what what are we looking at here? So the the dashed line was the original block response and then the solid line is the tuned block. So you can see the, the tuner went ahead and said, okay, look, you need, you need to adjust the gain so you have better steady state error here. So we go ahead and update block um, just so we get rid of the dashed line. And you can see there's a point right here and this is gonna measure our distance to uh, basically 180 degree um, phase crossing, and this is going to tell us our phase margin. So, you know, if you haven't taken any linear controls courses, then you know you probably haven't seen any of this before, which is fine. Um, just a couple rules of thumb when you're talking margins. Typically, you're looking to get 6 dB of gain margin and 30 degrees of phase margin. So, all we're doing here is we're just checking. Okay, our phase margin is 60 degrees. We're good to go. And the step response looks pretty good. So I think we're pretty happy with that. So we'll go ahead and update the block. Close this. Hit OK. And you know, let's, let's run the simulation, see what it looks like. So again, that was just Control T to run it. All right, so again, we're, we're not controlling theta, we're controlling, uh, we're controlling Q here. So I'm gonna go ahead hit this and we'll display our reference which is just zero and you can see okay we're able to we're able to track that pretty quickly it looks pretty good so now we want to do our outer loop so we can move this over there and let's add in another error signal now this one's going to be based on theta and we're going to have another PID controller. So we're going to call this one. This is the rate PI controller. This would be the angle PI. 
controller. So first thing, let's try just a proportional control here. So I'll hit P, apply, and we'll tune. Okay. So this actually looks pretty decent. Let's see. Let's try to slow it down. And it's pretty quick. We, we probably don't want to have this fast of a change in, in, um, in our response with the pitch angle. I'm thinking, you know, just kind of as I visualize it in my head, you know, you probably have to do more analysis to get a little bit more of a, a concrete rationale, but I'm thinking like two, two to three seconds to complete a change in, in pitch angle. Maybe, maybe, maybe faster, maybe, maybe like one to two seconds, but I feel like we'd want to have a, a pretty, pretty smooth transient response. So uh, we don't, we don't want to move the elevator a whole lot because that's going to just, we're going to create sort of additional transients. And we're also going to increase our drag when we do that. So if we try to take this design and slow it down, what we're going to find here, let's see if we did something like this. Let's see. So this actually this actually looks pretty good. So let's let's go ahead, update the block, and see what it looks like. It's still it's still getting there pretty quick. But maybe maybe let's make it a little bit slower. The other thing I'm clicking there is, it's basically kind of, um, you can kind of think of it as like taking your taking a response and moving it like down an octave or, or down a decade or something. So uh, this allows you to kind of get the fine control within a range, and then this allows you to just change the magnitude. So zero, we went from 10.04, if we go faster, it's going to be 1.004. Um, all right, so let's, let's play around with this and see what it looks like. So I'm going to update the block, close this, hit OK. Save it, simulate it, and let's see what we get. So, and I'm pressing space, hit, hitting one of the plots and pressing space to be able to do do the scaling. Okay, so it actually looks pretty good. So we, we started off with uh, some error, and then we've got the elevator working to correct that error, and we, uh, we kind of eventually settle on our command. So let's tell you what, let's go ahead, let's put in a step in our um, in our command and see how it responds to that step change. So for this, we'll insert a step. It's going to step at five seconds, and let's go from zero down to like negative five. Okay. And we need to log it again. Now stream it. Okay, so yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm pretty happy with the way this is looking. So uh, we've got our initial error here. We collapse that error, and then at five seconds, we get a step change, and it responds to that. Um, elevator looks looks pretty decent. You know, it's, it's moving somewhat quickly here, but I don't think it's anything too unreasonable. And our overall scale of elevator deflection is actually pretty small, so we're not using a whole lot of energy when we do this. Um, one other thing we can check is if we went back to... The tuning here, we can check what the margins are going to be. So I'll go back to the tune. Oh, and it, see the bummer is when you go back to that, it, it goes and tries to retune it. So I'm going to try to just match those conditions again real quick. Yeah, something like that. And we can do the same sort of plots. So we can go ahead and add um, open loop Bode plot. We'll look at the margins, characteristics, minimum stability margins. How are we doing? So, let's see. So 90 degree phase margin and 52.5. Man, that seems that seems really, really high. Let's see. That might that might be right. It might be because I think before what I was doing is I had integral action in here in the outer loop as well. Um, okay, so. For now, we'll say that that looks good. Um, so you got margins out the wazoo. You're doing pretty good here. Uh, we can close this. Now, one thing you might want to investigate, if you do some flights, if there's some sort of un unmodeled dynamics that, um, that that we don't have accounted for here, you might want to add integral action on the outer loop as well. Um, you, you don't need to because theoretically, the inner loop should take care of, that integrator should take care of basically removing any steady state error you'd have due to unmodeled dynamics or disturbances, and then the outer loop can focus on just having that proportional control 
utilize the the um, the robustness of the inner loop to be able to meet your command. But let's say you wanted to have integral action. Um, let's see, we could go here. We could change this to a PI controller. We'll apply, and we'll tune this. All right, so let's go ahead and slow this down a little bit. So you notice what we have the overshoot, so that, that's kind of characteristic of what you'd see when you add the integrator in there. Uh, we can play with the transient behavior here if we want to try to adjust. Basically what you're trading is if it's if it's lower um, to a point, you're going to get um, sort of your within your, your final error bounds a little bit quicker. You're going to have more overshoot. If we move it this way, which is kind of increasing our phase margin, then you're going to see it takes longer to uh, longer to settle basically. So we, we can try, let's try this value here, let's see what it looks like. So we'll go ahead and update the block. I'm just curious what, what this does to the margins. It should reduce our margins since we've added that integrator in there. Uh, so we can add a plot, we can go to open loop Bode plot, right click, characteristics, minimum stability margins. So we've gone down to, oh no, only 44 TB of gain margin. And uh, 70 degrees. So it did decrease it some, but I mean, you know, this is this is a, a bit excessive. Now, uh, one thing to keep in mind is you don't really have that much margin because there's a lot of um, a lot of parts of the system that we don't have modeled in Simulink. So we don't have the actuator model, which is the the biggest component to uh, sort of affecting your um, your linear analysis and your time demand results here. But also, you, there's also things you want to consider, like the bandwidth of your sensors as well. Um, and any sort of additional filters, like if you've got, because uh, you're using you're using the um, the attitude estimation filter to be able to generate that feedback signal for your your pitch angle controller. So there's going to be some sort of transient associated with that, which will have some sort of phase delay. But um, you know, I, I digress. So I think <laughs> I think for the scope of the project, um, th this is pretty good here. I would probably just honestly go back to the proportional control because we're able to get. A decent transient response, and we still have robustness because we've got the integral and the inner loop, and uh, we'll have more margin if we get rid of the integrator and the outer loop, and we'll reduce the overshoot. So I'm going to say let's go back to just the proportional control here. I'll hit apply, tune it again. That 2.3 might have been the value we liked before. So yeah, we'll just leave it like that. Okay, save and run. Let's see what happens. So we, yeah, we got the results we saw before. So one other thing that we should look at to kind of look engage the robustness is what if we weren't exactly at 30 feet per second when we started doing um, the control during our glide phase. Ideally, we should try to design the, the boost phase to be able to get us to um, apogee at this velocity. That way we just kind of glide down without having to do any initial transient to get us to our desired and designed uh, flight velocity for maximum range. But uh, let's let's say that we were at 15 feet per second. So let's go ahead. If we go back to the MATLAB workspace, Simulink's just complaining about something. Who knows? Uh, and I'm going to change V0. It's right now 30. I'm going to change it to 15. So we're going to cut it in half and see what happens. Let's see if it's robust to that. Okay. So we reran it. And um, yeah, you know it actually. Still did pretty good, you know. So we started at 15 here. You know, it's, it's a little bit more sluggish, a little, little more uh, awkward in the response, I guess you could say. And you've got this sort of initial reversal here. Um, and then as as we go back to this, we pick up speed, and eventually, you know, we're going to get closer to our 30 degree or 30 feet per second where we did our design. But um, it seems like it's still, you know, it's it's not quite as good a performance as you know when we're at the higher velocity, but it's still stable. It looks like it's still doing a decent job. Now, you know, one thing you will notice immediately is that, hey, you, you cut your velocity in half. So, you know, you reduced your dynamic pressure by a, a factor of four in that, in that way. And since, since we have such a lower dynamic pressure, the elevator is going to have to do a lot more work to be able to generate that same sort of moment to be able to control your pitch angle and pitch rate with the same sort of transient response. And you can see that here where we, we deflect all the way to negative 10. Whereas before when we were running at the 30 feet per second, you know, the most you saw was I think it was like maybe a, a two degree travel so if you go back to uh if we go back to 30 we'll run it again let's see yeah you know it's it's much much less around two degrees deflection 
So let, let's do the opposite. So now let's let's go ahead and speed it up. Let's say maybe we're flying at 45. Let's see what happens here. Run that. Okay, so yeah, still looks pretty good. The response is a little bit quicker uh, than before, but you know, overshoot basically is non-existent, and the um, transient response looks pretty solid. So I'd, I'd be pretty happy with this design. You know, the one thing that that I might want to investigate further is we are we are requesting that the elevator move pretty darn quick. So this could get us in trouble, and we'd probably want to, if we want to be a little bit more confident, we would want to add in a servo model. You know, just kind of use your best judgment for how fast the slew rate limit is and we we could we could see you know what's going to be the effect if we add that additional lag into the system and i mean in fact we can do that right now so let's let's go back reset this we're going to go back to our model here and we're going to add an actuator model so let's do a nonlinear second order actuator uh hope it still works <laughs> We'll go ahead and add that in there and natural frequency you know so so this is really it's, it's only going to be important it affects your stability but most of an actuator's life is spent in the slew rate limit so you're not really in the linear region a whole lot but well, well let's let's say like 60 radians per second or so 0.3 is pretty low damping i, I think you probably have the, this the sort of service you're going to be using I, i'd put it more at like you know something close to like 0.7 and then maximum deflection, we'll say like 25 and negative 25 degrees. The rate limit. I don't know. Play around with this. You know, maybe you know, kind of do some tests with your servo and see how fast it can move. Let's let's say maybe 180 degrees per second. So in a second, it can travel half of a circle. Um, and you know, let's just let's just kind of see what happens. So let's go back to our. I'm going to go back to our original design flight velocity, 30 feet per second. And I'm actually I'm going to comment this through first by doing Control Shift Y. So this is going to comment through the model, so we're not running it. So we'll just be able to get our baseline again, kind of get a picture of what this performance looks like. And then if we go ahead Control Shift X to uncomment it and run it, let's see what happens. Okay, so I'm going to go here reset it. So you can kind of see one one of the impacts is now that we've added in that um, that actuator. We've added in the limit on how fast the elevator can move. We, we've started to see some issues, so we've got some oscillations here, and we'd probably want to probably want to go into the inner rate loop and decrease the gains there. That way, we're not trying to control to Q as fast. And if we slow down that inner rate loop, we might need to add uh, integral control to the outer um, angle loop to compensate for that. So, well, just for kicks and giggles, let's see if we if we run it at 45. You know, let's see what would happen here. Should be even worse. Yeah. So these are the sort of tests you'd want to do. I mean, you know, see, it's eventually okay because you're eventually going to slow down to 30 and that'll be all right again. But you know, clearly our gain is is uh, is too high here. So let's go back to our 30 and we'll do another experiment. So let's see. What if we had? What if our actuator? Had a higher slew rate limit, so let's let's move this to like maybe 360. Run it again. Let's see if that helps us at all. Not really. What if we increase the the natural frequency? Let's put it at like 90. It's doing better. It's doing better. Um, but you know we want to make this somewhat realistic so let's say our rate limit was really 180 so how can we fix this all right so let's go ahead let's disconnect the outer loop and we're going to go ahead we're going to retune the inner loop and the cool thing is now we've got that actuator model in there so we should be able to kind of see the effect when we do the tuning yep yeah, and sure enough the dash block is our response uh, previously, and with those gains, you can see it's it's pretty oscillatory. If you look at the Bode plot, we'll add plot Bode open open loop and adjust the scale 0.01 to 1e3, and we can look at our margins. 
Yeah, so you can see originally what we had here. Yeah, I mean, you saw what it was before. We were in the, I don't know, it was really high, right? I, mean, I don't remember exactly what it was for the interlude, but I thought it was really high. But when we, when we include that actuator model, you can see our gain margin goes down to like less than 6 dB, and our phase margin is like 18 degrees. So that that's you know that that's the danger of designing without an actuator model because basically the the model the simic model is saying hey however fast you command that elevator you're going to get there and you're going to get that aerodynamic impact but in real life you're not going to get that so um, after seeing this I would definitely recommend that you guys go and kind of get an idea of what your um, what your servo response is and it's not just the unloaded servo right because you can take your servo and you can move it around and get an idea but it's it's the entire elevator um, control surface mechanism so it's it's going to be you know you're going to be loading that servo when you have it connected to the fin and you're moving the actual fin too so you need to get an idea of what's the sort of um, response uh, when the full system is hooked up so all right so we'll, we need to retune this simulink seems to like these values let's see if we play around with it can we get it you know we can probably get it a little bit quicker maybe maybe let's keep it right here and I'll just, you know, let's just leave it around what I had. We'll update the block, close this, hit OK, apply. All right, and now that we've tuned our inner loop, we're going to go ahead and retune our outer loop as well. So we'll go ahead and reconnect that, open up the outer loop, hit the tune button. Okay. Let's try to slow it down a little bit, get a little bit closer to maybe that value like we had it before. Update block. And let's look at our margins. So we'll go to add a plot, open loop body plot, and then characteristics minimum stability margins. So phase margin, still have oodles of phase margin. And our game margin looks pretty good too. So we'll update this block, go ahead and close it. Hit OK. Save. And we'll run. Let's see what it looks like. Okay. And all is well again. So all we did there is we just lowered the bandwidth, we lowered the speed of response, we lowered the gain of the inner rate loop. We were able to get rid of those oscillations. We're still able to achieve pretty decent transient response. Now you notice there there is some steady state error here. So if it was super important that we were able to track with zero steady state error, there we probably need to we either need to up the gain, which is going to you know kind of increase the response time, increase the elevator deflection, or we would need to add an integrator. If we add the integrator we're probably going to introduce some overshoot. So I think you could probably live with whatever errors and states that you're seeing here. Um, so, you know, I, I, I do it both ways. See if you can get a PI controller that has decent transient response, doesn't have a whole lot of overshoot, um, and does, you know, maybe you can get it to zero states of error, but I don't think it'd be the end of the world if you were to design it and have, you know, I mean, this, this is a pretty small states of error. It's not that big a deal. So. Anyway, you can try it both ways, see what you like. Um, hopefully you found this useful. I realize it's, it's probably gone on for a long time now, but um, you, you've seen some of the you know the initial mistakes I made and kind of how I went through debugging it and um, figuring out how you would encounter different design challenges and adjust the design to, to take that into account. So, um, you know, if you got any questions, uh, I'm sure we'll be able to discuss it in the in-person meetings, but also, um, I think I said this before, we could we can set up a, a call outside if, if you're really having some issues and, uh, try to get that taken care of. So uh, best of luck, and I look forward to seeing you all soon.